Welcome to the Bible class. It's always a joy to see you. I don't think there has ever been a period of time in human history when so many people were learning so much about God's Word. Rather than it diminishing and Bible scholars becoming fewer and Bible students becoming fewer, it is multiplying. Wherever you go in the world today, millions are studying God's Holy Word. If you're glad for that, say amen. amen. Because in the Word of God, we have the source of life, the source of eternal life. It's not in Sears Roebuck catalog. For some of these newspapers that I like to put the word stupid behind, it's so irrelevant what they're talking about, so nonsensical what they're talking about. How glad we are that we can go to a source of dignity. The Word of God bears dignity with it. And, it. and it bears permanency with it. That yesterday's newspaper is only good for one thing. That's to start a fire with. In the fireplace, of course. But the Word of God endureth forever. It's precious. Some of us keep our grandmother's Bible, our grandfather's Bible. Why? It is a source of living truth that pours into our innermost being. If you're glad for it, say amen. amen. We have been studying the promises of God. This is lesson number 16. How many love to study in a series like that? You like that? Well, we, we hope that if we bore deep enough, we'll hit oil. Some of you, we've been boring on a long time just to find sand. But anyway, uh, we're still working on it. And we would like to bore until we hit uh, the money, till we hit the goal, uh, till we hit that which brings forth fruit. Promises of God. Uh, today's lesson is primarily directed toward promises for those who are afflicted. There are promises for those who have hurts. Sometimes we can't identify where they came from. Uh, they can come from a natural uh, situation. Uh, uh, for, for example, you can drive a motorcycle 95 or 100 miles an hour and uh, God's not responsible and you don't have to blame it on the devil either. He didn't put his foot on the pedal. That was your foot on there. And then you wrap it around a couple of telephone poles and, and the doctor does a fine work of sewing you back together again and you have some pain, you know, along with it. Uh, God, God helps you. Of course he does. But I want to tell you something. You will bear those marks and scars as long as you live for being foolish. And, and so there are many reasons why afflictions can come upon us. Some of them are brought on by the devil himself. But what my lesson to you is this, is that you are a, a special group of people that have been born of the Holy Spirit and that if the devil or even if natural things bring an affliction, God delivers you. And, and there's hope. When there is no hope for the world, there's hope in God. If you know it, say amen. In the Psalm, Psalm 34 and verse 19, it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but Jehovah, Jehovah delivers him out of them all. I don't know exactly what he means here, the afflictions of the righteous. I would presume that being a, a, a king and a good man, and seeking to do what was right for his people, that it would be like the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, they just had to have a target, and you happened to be the one that was in the way, and you got the target. That he says, if you are a righteous person, people are going to pick on you. I know one thing, you do something a little unusual, and you're going to be amazed at the number of people that don't like you anymore. Or if you be just a little bit more successful than others, uh, well, one of the biggest problems in families is that one makes it and one don't. And the one that doesn't, they like him real good. And the one that does make it real good, they say, you must be crooked or you couldn't get rich like that. Are you still here or not? Or your mother-in-law said, I never did expect anything like that out of you. David decided that many of the afflictions of an upright person that people are going to hate you for being good. But he says, I got news for you. Your enemies are going to fall down flat. <laughs> Don't you like that? He says, but Jehovah delivers you from every one of them. That's good news for all of you today. If you go out this coming week and 
without your doing anything wrong, men begin to oppress you, speak evil against you. Just read Psalm 34, 19 and say, I've got news for you, fellow. Jehovah's going to deliver me out of all of these things. How many believes he'll do that? That's what I believe too. We do not deny that there are human problems. Uh, a man would be living in a fool's paradise to say that uh, the problems do not exist. I had a lady in California that came up to me and said, would you have mercy on me? And I said, well, <laughs> if I knew how I would, yeah. She said, I belong to the Christian Scientist Church, and she was a very elegant looking person, and uh, said, I've been taught most of my life that there was no sickness, and I've told many people that were sick there was no sickness, that it was an illusion they had. And I've told, told them that pain was something of an illusion, forget it. But since I have cancer in the last stages, and it's burst to the outside of my skin, and so there's no doubt about me having it now. And I've said I didn't have it long enough. And says uh, the pain that I'm suffering, the doctors can't, with all their medication, can't, can't calm it down. So there's no doubt I got pain. Says, can you rescue me? And I said, oh, you better believe it. <laughs> I'm the rescue squad from that kind of a thing. I said, I, I said, the first thing is this. We don't deny it's there. We say it is there. Without seeing it, we say it's there. We even believe it's there. No problem with that. We know pain is real. But I said, you want to know something? God's given me a gift that if there are a thousand people in pain, I can say one prayer and 998 of them don't have it anymore. That I have a victory against pain that's unbelievable. And I said, in fact, yours is already gone while you're talking to me. She says, it sure is. Well, I said, well, I just told you about it. And I said, we're going to command that cancer to decease. We're going to command that cancer to disintegrate. We're going to command it to go away. She said, you know, I never heard anything like this in my life. And we prayed for that woman and let her go. She may have had afflictions, but there was one who can deliver her out of them all. How many are glad for it? We don't deny problems exist. We don't deny that sin exists. We don't deny that, that disease exists. We don't deny their human afflictions. But there is something that you and I can do about them. We can reach out to God and God can deliver us from them. God reminds us in Acts chapter 7 and verse 9, these words, And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph unto Egypt with envy. He had been given uh, a priority in that family that was a little above normal and natural. Uh, he got a beautiful colored coat, and, and the other boys got a, a piece of dead sheep wrapped around their skins. And, and uh, he didn't like it. You know, you can't blame the brothers for it. Any father stupid enough to buy one boy a beautiful colored coat and wrap the others in a dead sheep, there's something wrong with you. You should treat your children the same. Let them all be in sheep's clothing or let them all have bright colors. How many of you ladies will vote for that? You men saw that, didn't you? And another thing is, if you're going to dress a boy, don't dress him in bright colors. He's not a girl and he's not a sissy. A boy is something that if you spank it in the right place, it's designed for spanking. And if you spank it long enough and hard enough, you'll make a man out of him. I got three grunts and one groan. All right. <laughs> That's right. You don't play with boys. You bring them up properly. Ask any Indian that ever lived and he'll tell you that's true. And uh, he says that his brothers were envious of him. They had a right to be. He had already told them they were going to bow down in, before him as if he was a king. And when you're the youngest son, you talk like that, you're in for it. I ought to know I'm a youngest son. And I got into it too. And he, God gave him favor and he gave him wisdom. Did you get those two? God gave him favor and God gave him wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And he made him to be governor over Egypt and all of his house. Governor over the land and over all of his house. Here was a man that was being what we call afflicted in prison for about 10 years for being a good man, an honest man, a clean man in jail for 10 years for that. And in all of these things that he called afflictions, 
Right in the middle of the verse it says, God delivered him out of all his afflictions. How many believe God will do the same for you? Now the promises of God today are related to the people that hurt you and related to the people that persecute you. That God will deliver you from those people. You've got to believe it. You don't have to be like the woman that went to court. And she said, now listen, judge, I, I've been living with this man for 30 years and I can't stand it any longer. Well, uh, he said, have you read in the Bible or somewhere where it says to heap coals of fire on their head? She says, well, I have heard of that since I tried hot oil and that didn't work. <laughs> it's so easy to miss the truth, isn't it? So easy to miss the truth. I believe that God can deliver you from any adversary. It matters not whether it's in the house, out of the house, or on top of the house. God is a deliverer! And He wishes to deliver you. And especially those that love Him best, He wants to deliver the most. If you know it, say amen. God says there is strength for the afflicted. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Here was possibly the greatest missionary of New Testament times and a mighty man of valor in the word, the Apostle Paul. And when he was greatly afflicted, he prayed to God about it, and God said, my grace is sufficient. I don't believe there's anybody in the world that has to give up. And if you are a giver up, you gave up because God, before God told you to. I don't believe God expects any human in the world to do what we call backslide. Life is not a backward operation anyway. Life is a forward operation. And God does not want anybody going backwards. I always tell people that there are seven steps toward demon possession. And the very first one is regression. At that point in your life when you start going backwards, you better get a hold of yourself. Because life wasn't built for that. There's no rear gears inside of you. They're all forward gears. And the Bible says the path of the righteous man grows Darker and darker. That's a devil's lie. Harder and harder. That's another one of his lies. The Bible says it goes brighter and brighter to the perfect day. <laughs> Glory be to God. I, how many believe that? Well, you got to live that way then. You got to look for the brightness. You got to talk to the storm. Storm, repel, go back. Problems, decease and quit. You got to talk to them. How many got something you ought to talk to? I thought maybe we had the right folks here today. He says, my strength is made perfect when people come against you. That's when God rises up the strongest in you. That's when you become stronger than any other time. And I believe the word of the Lord. We believe that teaching about affliction is the proper attitude to take of those that are older. It was the Apostle Paul who encouraged his young disciple, Timothy. In 2 Timothy 4 and 5, it says, Timothy, watch in all things. He wasn't speaking about his natural eyes, his spiritual eyes. Watch in all things. Endure afflictions. Not fall down under them, not quit under them, not saying, well, God didn't give me strength. God does give strength. Never has anything ever happened to a man that God doesn't give him strength to overcome if he'll accept it. You believe in that? He says, now, just be careful. Watch. Don't let the devil catch you asleep. <laughs> We're wide awakers. We're the vigilantes. Watch, he said, in all things, endure afflictions. If someone thinks they're going to hurt you real bad, start laughing. That'll hurt them. 
I've often said there's nothing so embarrassing as the devil as to hear you laugh out loud at him. That's the reason in this church we very often say, everybody laugh, time to laugh. You say, why? Devil takes off. He said, this is the most uncomfortable place I've ever been. Hell is full of groans and growls and all kinds of mess, and heaven's full of shouting and praising and rejoicing in God, and he doesn't want to have anything to do with it, and he never will have anything to do with it. But those on God's side are going to live in it forever. How many like to live in a place where everybody's happy? Woo! <laughs> I mean, I can live in a place where everybody's smiling all the time. Have you ever noticed how much prettier people are when they smile? Yeah, some of you just got better looking all of a sudden. Yeah. God made us that way. God made us that way. And that's the way for your victories. That's the way to overcome. And that's the way to go through with God. And that's what he wants in all of our lives. How glad I am that this older one who understood more of life than the younger one. Said to the younger one, I just want to tell you something, son. Be careful and watch. Keep your spiritual eyes open to what's going on. Then he says, just endure afflictions. Just, just go on through them. Just walk right up. If a man stands up against you and says you're a liar, just do like John Wesley. Of course, John Wesley was born a little later. But just, just be like John Wesley. He was walking down the path and met one of his enemies. And the man got right in the middle of the path and, and put his feet out like this and said, I wouldn't get out of the way of a fool. And Mr. Wesley smiled and, and, and bowed to him and said, well, sir, I would. <laughs> Come on by. Yeah. And I imagine John Wesley preached a great sermon that morning. <laughs> yes, sir. He had endured affliction, you see. He preached a great sermon that morning. If you and I can, can reach out to the attitudes of life and go over them and rather than go under them, there's victory in the name of Jesus. Glory be to God. And God wants you to know that these promises are yours in the moments of difficulty, in the moments of hardness, in the moments when the clouds are hanging low, the promises of God are real right then. When your books don't balance and a few little things like that, and you'd like to change cars and you're not quite ready for it. And you got payments on a car for four years and the car will run for one. It's real interesting. And that's a moment that you need some help from the Lord. Can you say amen? Yeah. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, I want you to see how Paul looked at these problems. Now, he had more problems than anybody in this room's ever had. He said, our light affliction... It didn't matter what they threw at him. He called it light. Did you know you have to measure your, your, your problems? You have to measure your own problems. How many already knew that? Yeah. A, a problem can come walking down the road to a spiritual giant. It's a midget. But to a spiritual midget, it's a giant. So you have to measure your own problem. The problem is the same size. It's how big are you? And if you've grown up in God and you mature in God, the thing is diminished. It's a molehill. But if you haven't grown up in God, it's a mountain. And so you've got to start calling your mountains molehills in Jesus' name. And in doing so, you'll grow. If you know it, say amen. He says the light affliction, which is but for a moment. <laughs> How many are glad for that? Yeah, I'm glad that some of mine have just been for a short time. Yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased about that. He, he said, your light affliction, it's really for such a brief time, it's such a short time, that it worketh for a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He says, I just want you to know something. That light affliction of yours is going to do something for you. I believe it did something. It did something for a man like Joseph. 17 years of age, maybe he'd gotten into his 18th year. And, and he was thrown into a pit by his own brothers. He sat, he stood it and listened and watched while his own brothers bartered with his cousins to sell him. Cousins and half-brothers <laughs> bargaining for your body and, 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 and sold him. And you know what that would have done to most of you? It would have made you angry until the day you turned your toes up and died. But you want to know something? You'd have died in Potiphar's house is where you'd have died. You still here? That man did not let that get into his spirit. 
He told them years later, he said, brothers, you meant it for bad and God meant it for good. Are you listening to me? It don't matter what your neighbors do to you, God means it for good and it'll be good for you. There's nothing bad ever happened to me that what didn't turn out good for me personally and soothing my spirits down and maturing my insides and helping me to be a little more patient with somebody else. Any trial that comes to, into your life, all these light afflictions, they will come to you and bring glory to your total being and bring spiritual reality to you and bring spiritual growth to you. They're simply good for you. <laughs> Just don't talk about it the day you're having them. Wait till it's over before you start praising for it, you know. The Word of God says in Hebrews 12 and 2, looking unto Jesus. Now, Jesus was our full example for our total life. It says, if you want to know how to handle things in this life, look unto Jesus. Isn't it amazing we look to everybody else? Well, Mrs. Jones, she couldn't stand it. Well, she's not Jesus. And Mr. Smith, he couldn't. He's not Jesus either. Looking unto Jesus. If you want to know how to handle life, look unto Jesus. He handled life. He knew how to live. Looking unto Jesus. Why? Because he is the author and the finisher. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and he is the end. You had nothing before you found him. And you're never going to find anything else after you get him. He's a, he's a top and the bottom and both sides. How many believe that? There is no other source that you're going to ever find to give you spiritual life excepting the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the author. He is the finisher of that thing within you called life, called faith, called spiritual living. He's all of it. Just keep looking to him for it. Now he says, you can look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith. Now let me tell you something about him. Who, for the joy that was set before him. What was the joy? A vision. He said, I will suffer on Calvary. Now, now he didn't have any anesthetics of any kind. He really suffered. He didn't use any drugs. He suffered. He says, for the joy. <laughs> he says, three days later, I'm going to be back. You think you're getting rid of me? I'm like a bad penny. I just keep turning up. He says, you don't need to wave goodbye at me. I'm going to be back here in three days. For the joy that was set before him. Do you know, if you knew what was on the other side of that problem, you wouldn't be worrying about it? Well, I got news for you. There's victory on the other side of it. There's triumph on the other side of it. There's glory on the other side of it. Promises for the beleaguered. Promises for those that are suffering what they call afflictions. The Bible persistently says, look unto Jesus. He is the beginning of your salvation. He is the totality of your salvation. What do you look for? He had a joy. The joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. He said, the pain in my hand, the pain in my side, the pain in my forehead, the pain throughout my being, that's nothing. I'm coming out of here in three days. I'll be risen from the dead in three days. I'll walk these streets again in three days. For the joy of the victory he was going to win. Say, that's great, isn't it? Could we bring this down into our domestic lives? And not let a little quarrel we think in the home is as big as a mountain, but reduce that thing to nothing. And know the joy that is out there beyond that thing. And let Jesus, let Jesus solve our problems. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. They were around there trying to shame him. Oh, you terrible thing, and you're dying with all these mobsters here. What a terrible person you must be. He despised the whole thing. I want to tell you something. If other people's heads is a place of your happiness, you're going to lose it pretty soon. You better let your happiness be in your spirit right down in there. And then whatever happens in the world around you, it won't disturb that. There's a deep, settled peace in my soul. There, there, there is a peace that passeth all understanding. If you're going to, what do my neighbors think? 
Oh, what does this one think? Ah, you're in for trouble because they change their minds every few minutes. You still here? Yeah, what they think of you today and what they think of you tomorrow is two different things. And so you better get your anchor settled and let your peace be in here and let it come from up there. He endured, the, he despised the, saint, the shame and today he is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Brother, he made it. He made it all the way. The Christian is never overcome by affliction. Never. Paul said again in 2 Corinthians 4 and 8 these words. We are troubled, he said. People hated him because he was so successful. On every side, troubled. But he says, we're not depressed or distressed. We're not distressed. You got that? You got it, everybody? Now, if you don't get it, then don't need my talking. There were troubles, but he says, we're not distressed. When I see people come in with these long faces, you're distressed. You're a loser. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're cast down, but we're not destroyed. They stoned him outside the city, and he got up and walked back in. <laughs> what you going to do with a man like that? Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We accept his crucifixion as our means of our salvation, and we carry it right around with us. And that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in my body. That the life of Christ will be manifest in my body. And he also said in Romans 12 and 21, Be not overcome with evil. Overcome evil with good. God wants you to be an overcomer. There are promises for those that are hurt. There are promises for those that are afflicted. There are promises for those that the devil seems to take delight in just hurting you. Jesus will heal the hurt and he will heal the total being, and he'll love you real good.